All right, can folks hear me right now? John, okay, good, thank you, John, for that thumbs up. Well, fantastic. Uh, this is gonna be a marvelous evening uh, and we're gonna get, uh, let folks join in at 6.03. Uh, we have over 420 folks who have signed up for this webinar, the, the biggest ever. So uh, that tells us something that there's some great interest in this and uh, we've got a really fun evening planned. Um, I'm just gonna get started and as people roll in, they can catch up as we go. Uh, so we'll get started. Uh, welcome to Hamlin University, Minnesota's oldest university founded in 1854. That's 168 years ago. Uh, we are very proud that the first two graduates were uh, two females, the Soren sisters, and they became educators in the Minnesota territory. My name is Tracy Ferdine, and since 1996, I've been the director of, the, of Hamlin Center for Global Environmental Education. Uh, this year, we are celebrating the 30th years of our founding, uh, 30 year, years ago, uh, by Will Steger. He actually packed out for the Antarctic expedition uh, uh, above the, uh, uh, the, uh, the ball, in the ballroom at Hamlin University. Our mission is to foster literacy, environmental literacy and stewardship in citizens of all ages, and we're built on four cornerstones. One is professional development for teachers, multimedia tools, K-12 curriculum, and community outreach. We believe that through this interdisciplinary lens of arts and science, we can come together to accomplish great things for society and the environment. Uh, this show tonight, this presentation tonight is a perfect example of how that has come together. Uh, I'd also like to say that 1854 uh, is an important year for the Anishinaabe and Ojibwe folks uh, in Northern Minnesota. That is a year uh, of the uh, a treaty, the final treaty that they had put together with the United States government. And uh, it's interesting. A lot of times we think that's a long time ago and far away, but uh, in fact, of course, Hamlet would have been founded that very year. So some of our founding members uh, were probably involved in some of the conversations. Uh, we are pleased to say that Hamlin has developed a land acknowledgement. And this is the first time I've read it. I think they've done a nice job. It was the community coming together, students, faculty, and administrators. And I would like to read that right now. Hamlin University acknowledges that the land on which we gather and refer to as Minnesota is the traditional and unceded territory of the Dakota and Ojibwe. Minnesota comes from the Dakota name for this region, Minnesota uh, Makose, the land where waters reflect the skies. We pay respect to the citizens of not only those tribes, but others as well, both past and present, and their continuing relationship to their ancestral lands. Making this recognition expresses gratitude and appreciation to those whose territory we reside on and honors the indigenous people who have, who have been existing with and on the land from time immemorial. This long-standing history is significant as land acknowledgments do not exist in the past tense or historical context. Colonialism, appropriation, and genocide have relevant real-time realities. We need to build mindfulness regarding the source of our present land privilege, understand the long-standing history from which it comes, and seek to reconcile our place within both. Hamlin as an institution and community will hold itself accountable as an indigenous partner by working stridently to amplify, address, and counter the historical and contemporary injustices that continue to impact indigenous people, individually, systemically, and structurally. There's a lot in that. It's, uh, it's marvelous to see that Hamlin has made that commitment. Uh, we have been personally working on that at the center, and this is a project that I think reflects some of the, the positive things we've been able to accomplish. Uh, tonight, we come together to engage in the third year of our Waters of the Sea stories. Uh, it has been very popular. As I said, we have over 420 folks who've expressed interest tonight. Uh, tonight's presentation is uh, Waters of the Sea stories, Northern Nights, Scarry Skies, and Ojibwe Perspective. Uh, I want to thank a few people as we keep going on this. One is to uh, Sarah Robertson for coordinating this. She has been uh, the leader of this for the last two years, two and a half years, and it's marvelous to have this uh, energy pulled together. Uh, you're going to find out a bit more about WDSE and Duluth's PBS station. This is a special relationship with WDSE. And uh, I want to uh, introduce uh, our next uh, uh, speaker, or, or I should say my associate, John Shepard, the associate professor and producer of our many, many multimedia tools. Uh, he is going to introduce you to our guest tonight, and uh, he will also then guide you through our interactive tool called Water to the Sea that has uh, some of these materials put in. A few little uh, housekeeping things. Uh, please use your question and answer button for questions on, uh, uh, to share the resources. 
uh, please keep your mic uh, on mute. And uh, and we found that uh, well, a lot of folks can't make it tonight, but they always come back and, and review this later on. So the webinar will be recorded mm -hmm. and you will receive a link to the webinar within two weeks. Uh, with that, uh, I think we're ready to go. John, is uh, are you ready to take it from here? Yes, I am. Thanks, Thank Tracy. Uh, so hello, everybody. My name is John Shepard. I am the Assistant Director of the Center for Global Environmental Education. And Tracy and I have been colleagues there for more than 25 years. So this is a very long uh, standing uh, of, uh, collaboration between us and the rest of our staff. So really thrilled to be here. Um, and tonight is a very special night. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, our presenters. And first, I need to say, uh, uh, regret to say, uh, Carl Gaboy has been struck ill and is not uh, able to join us tonight. So we're very, um, we wish him well. We don't think he's uh, significantly ill. Uh, but uh, as of yesterday, he was not feeling well enough to do this. So, uh, but he will be very much with us. Uh, as you will see, we have, um, he will be present in a number of the videos that uh, we have developed with him and with Travis. So um, needed to, to make that statement. Um, and then I'm uh, gonna... one thing we're having a problem with uh, people not being able to hear right now. They're not able to hear. No. Me. Yes. I can hear you. Okay. Let's see. Uh, My mic seems to be working. Do you know if they were able to hear Tracy? Okay. Oh, okay. You're getting a ton of feedback that people can hear. I think it's. It might be just a couple of people. Not. Yep. Okay. We got like 20 people that can. So thank you for that. Okay. Feedback, everyone. Okay. Thank you for the feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kim had hit uh, is hit. Please hit the uh, join with hit join with audio. Thank you, Kim. Uh, okay. Yes, you know, we've been zooming you. for a few years. It's always uh, fun to take the wild ride of getting it going. All right. So I'm going to keep going here. Um, so uh, the the th I'm going to introduce. Travis and Carl say more about them, but first just to say a little bit about how we have come together. Um, uh, the three of us have been working on an hour long documentary, Northern Night Starry Skies that we are producing. It's a co-production with WDSE, the PBS affiliate in Duluth. Um, Travis uh, is the uh, co-producer with me of the project and Carl has been a key a uh, uh, participant and interview subject and uh, been very generous in sharing both his stories and his artwork. So um, this evening tonight is really kind of the fruit of our, the three of us and uh, the rest of our production team uh, coming together in that project. Um, a little bit more about Carl. Uh, Carl is a member of the Boys Fort Band of uh, Lake Superior Chippewa. Uh, he is truly a uh, American Indian scholar, Ojibwe scholar, and a tremendous artist. Um, he uh, uh, his his work has been featured in many places throughout uh, northern Minnesota. He has a, a series of incredible murals in uh, Superior, uh, the library, the main library in Superior, Wisconsin. Uh, and I've got two of his books highlighted here. Um, one of which, Talking Sky, has been a focal point of the documentary that uh, we've been developing. Um, and what one of the things he's really pioneered is making these connections between um, the, the constellations, the heavens, as they have been understood by the Ojibwe uh, over time, and uh, cultural stories and history associated uh, with the constellations uh, and with some of the mythology and, and associated with them. And that is one of the areas where he's really done some brilliant work. So we're really excited to be able to share some of that with you. Talking Rocks is a similar um, undertaking to his Talking Sky book. It looks at uh, geology of Minnesota. Uh, both of these are co-written co uh, with Ron Morton, who is a uh, geologist. And so they're really dialogues uh, exploring these topical areas. Um, so really thrilled to be uh, working with Carl, who uh, I think I said he was on the faculty, uh, an American uh, Indian studies professor at the College of St. Scholastica for many years, now is still uh, active as an artist. 
Travis, we're going to, you'll be hearing much more from Travis. He is with us and we'll be uh, get, sharing his presentation with you. Um, it's been just a joy to meet with and work with Travis. We got to know each other uh, several years ago as we began uh, working, developing media stories about uh, Northern Minnesota. He is a truly gifted photographer, uh, best known for his night photography, but also a wonderful landscape and nature uh, photographer. And he has a day job, and that's uh, being the uh, manager of Grand Portage State Park. So uh, a guy with many talents and many skills. I'm going to play a short clip um, that is uh, showcases, it, it kind of introduces Carl and uh, Grand Portage Monument. And this is uh, Grand Portage um, uh, Reservation. This is a, a clip that is actually the uh the part of the opening sequence of um our documentary let me get the right one okay here we go so this is just a couple minutes i'm going to give you a flavor of both the documentary and a chance to hear a little bit from travis hello all my relatives travis and disney cause makwa and dudam kichioni gaming and dunjaba my name is Travis. I am Bear Clan and I am from Grand Portage. Grand Portage is an Indian reservation that makes up the very northeast tip of Minnesota. We are surrounded by massive water with Lake Superior. We have the Pigeon River, which forms the northern boundary of the reservation. And we have some of the highest elevations in the state. So there's a lot to see and a lot to photograph here. The quality of our night sky here is just incredible. Um, you've got nights where it's so dark there's so little light pollution that once your eyes adjust you can actually walk around by the starlight with all of the traveling i've done i don't think i've found a place that has kind of that all-encompassing beauty that this place has this is home for me family's history in this area goes back, I'm sure, a lot farther than I even realize um, on my mom's side. And that family connection, just having a longevity in a place, you know, it's, you kind of feel that through not just the place, but through your family members as well. And you know that your people have been here for so long and that just that connection comes through to you in ways that you don't even realize sometimes. And with that, I'm going to stop and turn the program over to Travis. Um, again, welcome, Travis. We are uh, so pleased you could be with us and uh, truly honored to be able to be partnering with you uh, in this work together. Thank you, John. Can you guys hear me? Let's see, so I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, and you guys see my image okay there? Uh, yeah, I think, what was it about probably three years ago or more now when we first met and you guys approached me to do these short video clips and uh you know i i had no idea who you were it was <laughs> and i'm like who are these guys kind of coming out of the blue and 
uh, wanting to do this cool stuff. But here we are a few years later and we've got a film coming out and it's uh, been an honor working with you guys as well. It's really been a lot of fun. So uh, we did just watch uh, an introduction of myself, but I like to do that at the start of my talk. So I'm going to do a little bit of repetition here. Buju and Dinaway Ma Ganidug, Anin, Travis and Disney Kaz, Makwa and Duodem, Kichione Guming and Dunjaba. So, hello, all my relatives. My name is Travis. I am Bear Clan and I am from Grand Portage. And I'd like to thank um, the folks from Hamlin for inviting me to be here tonight. Um, as John mentioned, unfortunately, Carl is under the weather and not able to join us, but we'll do the best that we can to kind of fill in for him and give a sense that he's still here uh, or that he's here with us. And <clears throat> for those of you that may not know, um, the Grand Portage Anishinaabe Nation is an Indian reservation at the very northeast tip of Minnesota. It's bordered by Lake Superior to the east and south, Ontario, Canada to the north, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area and Superior National Forest to the west. And Grand Portage is um, what, what we call the tip, the very tip of the Arrowhead region of Minnesota and has some of the most dramatic terrain to be found anywhere in the state. Up here, we've got rugged mountains, we've got beautiful inland lakes, wild rivers, some pretty dense forest, and <clears throat> some of the darkest night skies to be found anywhere. So for a photographer, it is an incredibly rich place to call home. And I've been a photographer for most of my life. And for most of the time that I've been a photographer, my favorite subject has been the night sky. The night sky for me is something very special. As much as I love photographing it, even more than that, I love the simple act of just experiencing it and appreciating it. And from nights, uh, from nighttime, when I was a kid, spending nights with my dad while he was out trying to capture images of the Northern Lights on film, to walks under the stars with my mom, uh, to moonlight hikes and bike rides, the night sky has always been there and I've always loved it. And as I like to say, it's um, a different world from that of the daylight hours. Uh, I often say that nighttime is kind of a magic time. The world looks different at night, more mysterious. Um, sound travels differently. The quality of light on the landscape can defy description. But I also, uh, I also love the water. Water connects the earth and the sky in more ways than one. It's connected in this visual sense when you see the Milky Way or the Aurora Borealis reflected in a lake or in a river, but it's also connected physically um, as moisture evaporates into the sky and then later comes back down as rain. Um, photography, the night sky and water are my most important um, anchors. They're the things that help keep me centered and balanced. And when I'm standing or laying underneath the glow of the Milky Way, kind of bathing in that magical starlight, that's when I feel the most relaxed and the most at peace. And <clears throat> my hope is that through my photography and my passion for the night sky, that that will inspire others to explore the stars either for the first time or to deepen perhaps an already existing relationship that they have with the night sky. And for me, even though I grew up on a reservation, indigenous star knowledge has been pretty hard to come by. There just aren't that many people, at least in my local community, that seem to know a whole lot about it. So it's been a, a, quite an education and quite an honor getting to know Carl Gaboy as he has shared some of what he's learned over his lifetime of putting some of these pieces of star knowledge together. And so over the last few years, I've been working on um, several projects, but the most exciting of those by far 
is the Dark Sky documentary called Northern Night Starry Skies. And so in that vein, um, I'd like to, I'm going to share a few more clips throughout my presentation from the documentary. And in this next video, um, Carl is going to be telling us about the pictographs on Hegman Lake, which is near Ely, and how he came to an understanding of the images that are found on those rocks. Everywhere you have these great big cliffs, these vertical cliffs that come down to the water, there are about 200 sites of pictographs between northern Minnesota and Hudson's Bay. And the ones at Hegman Lake are absolutely beautiful. The colors are clear. There are three big visual images. And over the years, there's been all kinds of people who wrote about pictographs. Dallas talked about them as uh, mysterious, something from the past, but we don't know what they are. How do you climb inside the brain of someone who lived 300 years ago? And I must have gone to that site about a dozen times mm -hmm. over the years, from high school on all the way till a few years ago. I made sketches and I took photographs of the site and I kept working over these images over and over again, trying to piece them together. But I didn't realize then that I had to think like a scientist and not an artist. And that was a big leap for me. Yeah. And and when I did that, that's when I that's that's when th things started to go together. Who are the people that met there and said, "Well, this is what we have to remember, and this is what we have to teach, yeah. and this is the way we're going to remember it." by putting these images on the rocks, the winter maker, great panther, and a great moose figure. So that we see the image of the rocks, we see the constellation, and then there's this prophecy, the prediction, the story that goes with it. The traditions that extend all throughout uh, Ojibwe lore that go with it. Mm -hmm. So I, rather than just looking at the pictograph themselves as art. And, you know, I was tempted to do that because I'm an artist looking at the pictographs. And I said, well, this is yeah. the work of my ancestors. It's like being reunited with an old friend. All this knowledge is there. You're going to say the moose isn't important to Ojibwe culture. It's central to Ojibwe culture. Yeah. The winter maker, yeah. the winter maker. We, we live six months of winter here in this part of the world. It's very, very important. So there's all kinds of stories about either the great moose or the winter maker and the great panther, the spirit of the water and the spirit of spring, the dangerous part of spring, the floods. The Hegman Lake site is not only the clearest site, the most photogenic, that is a picture that you take of it. It's always real clear and bright, but it's, a, it's the greatest collection of the visual images of the and the, the pants are the most like, winter maker figure. There's a lot there. There's still to be interpreted. So um, let's see, John, did that play okay? Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, that sounded pretty good. Okay, great. Um, 
So Carl mentioned that in that video that the moose is, um, I think that, did I jump ahead too far here? Sorry. Um, Carl mentions that the moose is central to Ojibwe culture and, you know, moose certainly are, even generally speaking, um, sort of an icon of the Northwoods. I know like at the state park up here in Grand Portage, when visitors come in, just about everybody that visits Northern Minnesota, it seems when you ask them what they want to see, like they'll come in and say, what is there to do around here? Well, what are you, what are you hoping to see? What are you, what are you interested in? Almost everybody says, you know, I want to see a moose. And over the years, I've been lucky enough to have had quite a few memorable encounters with moose. And this photo here is one such moment where I was paddling down the Pigeon River, which is the international boundary between the US and Canada up here. And I was coming around this bend in the river and here was this beautiful cow and calf just grazing right along the river bank, like five feet from the water. And I was in my kayak, maybe 10 feet from shore. So, you know, less than 20 feet away from them. And as soon as I saw them, I stopped paddling and I grabbed my camera. And as I drifted by, they both just kind of raised their heads up and their ears swiveled right towards me and watched me as I glided past them. So it's kind of funny, like I'm staring at them, they're staring at me. And as I drifted past, I took a series of maybe five images, just kind of, you know, click, click, click as I went by. And this one here was my favorite. And I think really it was the only one that actually turned out that wasn't all fuzzy. Um, and that's a good example of a moment that was mostly luck. Although I did, you know, I did put myself in a in a good place at a good time where it's conducive to seeing moose, but still it's it's luck when it happens. Um, other encounters have required kind of more deliberate planning and action. Whoops. Gotta get to my other, there we go. So one example of that is um, a few years ago, my friend uh, Paul Sunberg, who's a very, very good wildlife photographer, had contacted me and said, hey, you know, I've been scouting out this, this place where <clears throat> there seems to be a lot of moose activity. There's a lot of sign that the moose are using this area. So, you know, you want to go out one morning sometime in the near future and check it out. And I was, yeah, let's do it. Um, and that morning we went out we didn't so this is about an hour and a half from my house so i had to get up pretty early um, the best time to call is at first light and so you kind of want to be out there at on location before the sun comes up and so i had to travel i think it was close to two hours with you know a little over an hour getting from my place to grand ray and then to go pick up paul and then drive up into the woods to where this area was. And we got up there and it was super foggy. Like the visibility wasn't very good. And, you know, we drove out to this spot. And I remember Paul saying, you know, in my experience, if you don't see a moose in the first hour, you're probably not going to see one. So we set up, we got our, our tripods and our cameras all ready to go. And Paul takes out his moose call and, and he starts calling. And, you know, five minutes go by, 10 minutes go by, 15, 20, nothing. We hadn't seen anything. We hadn't heard anything. Um, and so he tried for probably an hour and 15 minutes, I think, and never saw a moose. And so we kind of given up. And he said, well, there's a couple other spots in this area. We can drive up into some other areas that have been logged nearby, and maybe we'll see one up there. So we tried that. We went to another spot. He tried calling, nothing. Went to another spot. He tried calling and nothing. And then we got to the, the area shown here with these big pine trees looking across this meadow. And we'd 
pretty much given up. It's like 10 o'clock now. And yeah, you know, there's no moose in the area. They're not coming out. So I said, I'm going to go over here, take a picture of this little white pine. And Paul said, well, I'm going to go over here and just practice calling for a while just to get some more practice in. So he went over and he, he kept calling and I'm over here like a hundred feet to his right, taking pictures of this little tree. And after like maybe his third call, I thought I saw movement out of the corner of my eye. So I looked up and sure enough, here was this, um, this bull moose. And I don't know if you guys can see my mouse pointer here. You probably spotted the moose already, but he's right in the center of the picture. And he's probably 200 feet away from us, maybe at that point. And so I looked up and looked back at Paul, and he was still calling. And I tried to get his attention to say, you know, Paul, there's a moose over there. So I looked back, and I'm like, Paul, Paul, try not to be too loud. And Paul just, what? You know, just loud. And I said, shh, there's a moose over there. What? So then he looks and right away he sees it and oh my gosh, like, what are we going to do now? This moose is pretty good size. You know, he's curious. He's definitely intrigued by the call and starts coming towards us. So we both kind of look back at the car, which is another 200 feet away. And we're like pointing at the car. Let's go back to the car. So we did that. We worked our way back as, as I guess, quickly and quietly as we could. And the whole time, this moose just kept coming closer and closer and eventually got to within, I don't know, within 100 feet of us for sure. And he seemed to really like getting his picture taken because he would walk a few feet and then he would stop and he'd kind of look to the right, look to the left. We would get pictures. He would walk another 20, 30 feet and he'd do the same thing, just kind of pose there. It was pretty incredible and ended up being one of the best mornings of, you know, moose calling and moose viewing and photography that either of us had ever experienced. And <clears throat> here is an illustration done by Carl of the moose constellation. And despite how things look outside right now with parts of the state, especially up here in northern Minnesota, we're getting hammered with snow. We are still technically in the autumn season. And autumn is the time of the moose. It's when they're most active and when they're most aggressive as they look for a mate. And the moose is one of the pictographs represented in those Hegman Lake pictographs. So the next slide I'm gonna show you is one of my photographs where you can see um, the moose constellation. And the moose is in Greek lore is Pegasus. And it's primarily these four stars here that make this, this big square in the sky. So as I go to the next slide, you can see those four stars in the upper right half of the picture. And on the top left here, there's this W shape in the stars. That's Cassiopeia. We've got Andromeda Galaxy right in the middle here, but just above the tree. And then here's the moose, the square that makes up the moose body on the upper right. So it's kind of cool to um, visualize that and then see it in the sky. And so next, I'm going to play another short video where Carl tells us a story about moose. Talking about the moose in the night sky, it's a fall constellation. Right, the great moose pictograph I identified the constellation of Pegasus. The figure is kind of squarish. Well, moose are kind of square. And that's a great square of Pegasus. So Pegasus rises late summer, just as the moose are starting to get a little aggressive. And then as the fall goes on, the 
moose constellation gets higher and higher in the sky. And so this is when the moose present themselves to the hunter. And not only do they present themselves to hunters, but they present themselves to cars and locomotives yeah. and yeah. other things. They're very aggressive. They, yeah. they don't back away. Then what happens is that the constellation starts to set. And that's when the moose get weaker. As the winter goes on and as spring comes, the moose just suffer from the cold and the scarcity of food. They get weaker and weaker until it finally sets in the west. And so the rising and setting of the constellation matches the rising and setting of the moose out there in the forest. Fall or autumn is a time for hunting. And you talked about a cultural story associated with moose. Could you share that again? Well, it was based on a pictograph of a moose smoking a pipe. In all the hunting societies, all the Indian hunting societies, there's usually a story just like this about how humans got permission to harvest animals. There's no question that Indians revere the animals they hunted, but they still hunted them, still killed them, they ate them. And so what happened that made this possible uh, ethically? You know, the Plains Indians have this about the bison, here we have this about the moose, that there was a, a obligation, a mutual obligation between moose and humans. <laughs> Looking back to a legendary time when, I should say mythical time, to uh, when animals could speak and humans could speak to them. And there's a moment when animals gave permission to humans. They would give of themselves to humans, provided humans did certain things. And one of the things was uh, ceremonies of respect and honor. Sure. And if the Indians stopped doing that, the animals would withhold their gifts. And other would be their social obligations, uh, to share the food once you got it, mm -hmm. to uh, take care of your family, to, uh, to honor elders. So that pictograph of the moose smoking a pipe was the use of tobacco as part of these ceremonies. In the story, the pipe makes its appearance in a moose lodge. The moose in this story live in a lodge just like people do. And they have different places that they sit in and sit around the fire and they converse. And this pipe magically floats through that doorway and goes around the moose population. And that's what set in motion the use of tobacco as a sacrament to honor the moose. And the moose then agree that they would give of themselves. Indigenous cultures in our region have developed their own understanding of the night sky over thousands of years. Okay, sorry about that. It started going into the next video automatically. Uh, okay, so next we're going to talk a little bit about Orion and the constellation. Orion is known as the winter maker to the Ojibwe people and is the most noticeable constellation in our winter night sky. And I've heard Carl describe that some of the figures represented in the constellations are at the height of their power when they appear highest in the sky. And, okay, sorry, my cats keep uh, getting in the way here. And the winter maker is a good example of that representation of height of power when they're up high in our sky. And as we so as we progress through autumn, 
late in the night, just a few hours before sunrise, Winter Maker can be seen rising above the horizon. And then during the deepest, darkest, coldest depths of winter, uh, the constellation is very prominent in the sky. And then as spring slowly arrives, Winter Maker drops below the horizon, not to be seen again until fall. And we saw a glimpse of this in, in the video. This is a painting done by Carl called Shooting the Winter Maker. And in his book, Talking Sky, there's a short story about it that I'd like to read to you. So to accompany this painting, it's a representation of the winter being too long and parents make bows and arrows for the children and then call them outside when it gets dark. And there they are told to shoot the winter maker from the sky with their bows and arrows. So they send their arrows flying upwards and sure enough, they mortally wound him. After that, he slowly falls from the sky and spring eventually comes and the weather warms up. And another short story with winter maker also from also uh, contained in Carl's book. In this story, um, Winter Maker would not leave Nanabuju's land. Sick and tired of the cold and snow, Nanabuju decided that the only way to get rid of him, to get rid of Winter Maker, was to trick him by offering him a great feast. And so the women in Nanabuju's household roasted waterfowl and coals prepared thick stew in clay pots and set out some smoked fish. The winter maker who had accepted Nanabuju's invitation to the feast arrived like a blizzard as he blew through the door of the lodge. He sat down and ate some dried fish. Wouldn't you like some wild rice and dried cranberries to go with the smoked sturgeon? Asked Nanabuju. And that was only the start. For by flattery and cajolery, Nanabuju got the winter maker to eat so much that he began to sweat. He threw off so much heat that the very snow began to melt. And it was then that winter maker realized he'd been tripped and he escaped out of the lodge running towards the north. Don't forget, he cried over his shoulder as he ran away. I will be back. And got a few photos of mine here that show Orion or the Winter Maker. This first one was this last September, early in the month, first week of September, it was about 3.30 in the morning. And you can just see the constellation here almost in its entirety, right above the, the ridge on the right side of the photo. But he, he only starts to show up late in the evening that time, that time of year. But as we get deeper into winter, much more visible and much more prominent. So this would be on December 23rd when this one was taken. And I don't know if you guys can see my mouse pointer, but I'm trying to outline. So here's the constellation, the main part of it here that we think of as Orion, and then the outstretched arms of Wintermaker continue all the way through out here. Okay. Here's another one. This one was taken about a week after New Year's, and Wintermaker is even more prominently visible here. It was a much colder night. The stars were just super, super bright. It felt like you could reach up and grab them. And again, here's uh, the main body of Orion and then extended out to include these arms is the whole constellation of Wintermaker. And since meeting Carl and learning about Wintermaker and, and the difference in the constellation versus the Greek version, I, I can't look up at the sky anymore and, and not see those longer outstretched arms that encompass Wintermaker. It's, I try, but I can't. It's just, 
it's so obvious to me now. I couldn't, I can't believe I didn't notice it before. But then as, as winter comes to a close and spring arrives, we see the return of the brightest part of the Milky Way, which is the core or the galactic center of the galaxy in which we, we reside. And so this bright ribbon of light is seen throughout spring, summer, and fall. And to the Ojibwe, it is known as the River of Souls. And while it spans the entire sky from horizon to horizon in the spring, summer, and fall, the brightest part of the Milky Way is visible just above the southern horizon. And when it first appears in the spring, it's almost level with the horizon. But as the seasons change through summer and into fall, it becomes more and more vertical in the sky. So probably mid-March to late March, again, kind of like Orion in the fall, you have to go out at like three or four in the morning, but you'll see the Milky Way coming up above the horizon, kind of like this. And then later in the summer, or as the seasons change, it, it rises. And by the time you get into August, when it first comes up after dark, it's pretty much vertical in the sky. So just a kind of another reminder of how everything is always changing. Things look different with each season, each passing month. And so now we've got one more short video with uh, Carl talking about the Milky Way or the River of Souls. The Ojibwe, the Milky Way, is the River of Souls, or further west where there's more pathways over the landscape than there is water routes. They call it the Path of Souls, where you'd walk it. But in this part of the country, it would be the river. And what a beautiful river it is, just brilliant, shining. One time I asked my dad, I said, what's Ojibwe heaven like? And he said, it's the greatest place in the world. It's just like here. And I said, you mean like with winter? And he said, yeah, it's just like here. I said, mosquitoes, mosquitoes? He said, yes, it's just like here. What could be better? <laughs> so I'm thinking it'd be the Ojibwe who think of heaven as just the greatest place in the world. It's just like her, it's just like her. If you lived an evil life though, you you disappear into the cosmos and you're gone. You're just, there's no afterworld for you. When the Ojibwe talked about a person dying and going to the afterworld, you travel that river of souls. And the Milky Way has a band of beautiful light coming down to the horizon. And then there's another branch of it that forks off and then disappears. And people who've lived and done evil in their life took that other branch and would just disappear into the cosmos. But those that lived a good, lived a good and proper life would continue on their journey to the afterworld where there was, they came to a land of forests and prairies um, with full of game and full of all the ancestors that have died went on before you get reunited with them. So 
I'm going to talk a, a couple about a couple more constellations before we wrap up here. And one constellation that is visible to us in the summer is Nanabuju, also known as Scorpio. And Nanabuju is a pretty prominent figure in Ojibwe culture. As Carl describes, he is a very complicated Ojibwe character. And he has many different aspects to him, both good and bad. And there are more tales told about him than any other character in Ojibwe history. In general, he's portrayed as the model for many cultural values and norms, and is thought to be the one who is responsible for the way things are in the world. And so I'd like to read a selection from page 49 of the Talking Sky book here about Nanabuju. And this goes on to say that often he is a trickster, sometimes he's the tripped, often the philosopher, and sometimes the debunker of philosophy, often the teacher, sometimes the recalcitrant student. Often the omnis omniscient God, sometimes the bungling man. He is pictured as a giant and as a normal person and often can take the form of an animal. He is simultaneously the twin brother of the wolf and the only child of a mortal woman and a spirit father. In short, he is the embodiment of all the qualities found in the catalog of Greek, Roman, Norse and any other gods or demigods of the many human cultures. And yet he is distinctly Ojibwe for he is the embodiment of the people. And here we can see well, if I go back um, so there's three stars on the right that make Nanabuju's bow. And we can clearly see those stars here, just to the upper right of the small island on the Lake Superior shoreline in Grand Portage. And then I guess the stars on the left, just to the left there would be his arm pulled back, kind of drawing the arrow, drawing the bow, ready to shoot the arrow. And in this picture here, this is kind of a surreal one with a couple of planets visible. On the left is what almost looks like the moon is actually Mars. And then over on the far right is Jupiter. And somewhere in the middle here um, kind of gets lost because it's right in the middle of the Milky Way. But Saturn is visible here as well. And I think this was 2015. And for a good chunk of the summer, we had this conjunction where um, when it wasn't full moon, as the Milky Way came up, you'd see these two planets kind of flanking the Milky Way. It was pretty pretty cool. And here's another one that shows Nanabuju. And over on the right, these three stars that make the arc of the bow. And then the brighter stars just to the left, kind of that pulling back and drawing, getting ready to shoot the arrow. And so the last constellation that I'd like to talk about tonight is one that we are almost all certainly familiar with, and that is the Fisher. Although most people know him as Ursa Major, the Great Bear, or more commonly, the Big Dipper. Fishers are amazing creatures with, incredibly, with incredible agility and prowess. I have seen, personally, I've seen them move through the forest as if the forest isn't even there. And they climb trees more easily and silently than you can imagine. And while I've seen them now and then over the years, this photo is the only time that I've ever gotten a good picture of one. And mostly when I've seen them, I've been out on bike rides and been biking down a forest road and I'll see one dart across the road in front of me. And typically it'll run up, it'll run up the opposite side of a tree from me and then kind of stop and like 
look around the tree, kind of peering at me. Just very, very curious in their appearance anyway. Um, and there's a story about how the fisher earned his place in the night sky. And again, Carl talks about this in his book. So I'll read this one to you. How, how Fisher earned his place in the night sky. So Fisher and his friends were out on a hunt. The hunt lasted weeks and weeks. The hunting was difficult because the snow and cold would not leave them alone. Fisher's friend, the bear, began to worry. Winter has lasted too long, he told Fisher. If spring does not come soon, we will starve. The moose and caribou will have nothing to eat. The beaver will have no lily roots or fresh aspen bark. Something has happened in the sky world to stop the seasons from turning as they should. Let us send Wolverine up to the sky world to find out what the matter is, said Fisher. So they sent for Wolverine. He agreed to go and ascended to the sky world by way of a great pine tree. He was gone for many days. Finally, he returned and said, a great ogre beyond the edge of the sky has captured all of the birds. He has imprisoned them in great birch bark macaques. That is why winter will never end. Who is this ogre? asked Fisher. He is bigger and more cruel than any being here in this world, said Wolverine. Worse, he has his brothers with him to guard the birds. Well, we must kill him and free the birds, said Fisher. Having said this, he strapped on his quiver and his knife, picked up his bow and set out. He came to the great pine tree and climbed it. From the top of the tree, it was but a short step to the opening in the sky. And once through the opening, Fisher found himself in a wonderful world. It was warm. Flowers were everywhere. And the air was alive with the buzzing of bees. Moving across the land, Fisher soon came to the ogre's encampment. The two guardians, the ogre's brothers, turned to face him. Realizing quickness was his only chance, Fisher dashed between their legs. He ran as fast as he could to the huge baskets and stove them open, and out poured the birds, flickers, jays, robins, chickadees, ducks, geese, and swans. And up they spiraled in a great black cloud that darkened the entire sky. Then, in a tornado of wings, they plunged down through the hole in the sky and entered the world below. The great ogre shouted in rage. He and his brothers ran toward the brave little fisher. Once again, Fisher used his speed and quickness. He dashed between their legs and raced to the hole in the sky. Without hesitating, he threw himself through it. Far below, he could see the earth. And before his eyes, it was changing from white to brown to green. Down he fell, the ogre's arrows whizzing all around him. Fisher was lucky. None of the arrows found its mark, and he landed on soft, mossy ground. He knew the ogres would not be far behind him, so he had to make his escape fast. He ran this way, he ran that way, he dodged terrible flights of arrows, but try as he might, he could not lose the ogre or his brothers. In fact, they were getting closer. In desperation, he raced back to the great pine tree, thinking he could fool them by climbing into the sky world, then doubling back to earth. So quickly he climbed the tree, but he was not fast enough. The ogres saw him, and a great volley of arrows whizzed by, missing him by inches. And at the top of the pine tree, Fisher leapt to the north. Here, one of the arrows found its mark and pinned him to the sky. Around and around he turned, and there he is to this very day. With the freeing of the birds, the ogres lost their power over the earth. So they left by way of the great pine tree back through the hole in the sky to their world. And of course, I mentioned that Fisher is the Big Dipper. And here we see the Big Dipper. And Carl explained that the arrow that found its mark 
was the tip of, or the end of the, the handle of the pot on the dipper, which would be um, the end of Fisher's tail. And also in this picture, we've got uh, Comet Neowise down here, just below the constellation. And over on the right, the streak going upwards to the right is a Perseid meteor. And here's another, another photo that shows a little bit of Northern Lights and Fisher constellation over here on the left. So tonight I'd like to close out by just reading one more short paragraph from Carl's book. And this is from the epilogue, which is titled Lost Knowledge. So Carl writes, or it's written in the book here. Um, when you think about it, stars are just stars, but constellations star figures are the imaginary lines that are drawn between them. Constellations reflect the identity of the people who drew them. Their creativity, imaginations, wisdom, traditions, and science. So trying to put together the Ojibwe night sky, the sky figures, and their stories is a real and important way of understanding, appreciating, and honoring the Ojibwe and their life on the land. And that is the conclusion of my presentation for this evening. Miigwech, and thank you all. So Travis Miigwech, uh, to you as well, that was incredible. Um, really appreciate that. Uh, thank you for sharing uh, your stories, your beautiful pictures, and and for uh, bringing Carl into the conversation. Um, if you can stop sharing your screen, I'm going to just spend a few minutes uh, introducing you to how we are, some of the ways we are um, uh, enabling folks uh, all over, uh, really all over Minnesota, all over the North Country, uh, to access this content that we've been uh, looking at. Um, so, uh, as has been talked about, we have a broadcast documentary coming up soon, and I'll have more information about that in a minute. But that's part of a larger initiative, uh, and that larger initiative also includes uh, a series, a network of multimedia kiosks. Uh, we now have more than 18 of them. I think we're up to about 20 with more to come that are distributed in some of the most heavily visited areas um, along the North Shore uh, from Duluth all the way to uh, Grand Portage. And uh, the, these kiosks play an interactive program that, uh, that celebrates the natural and cultural history and heritage of the region. And all the same content also is incorporated in this Waters to the Sea program, which is an online program uh, that is available to schools. Um, and then there's yet a third, uh, a third part of the uh, a project, which is a, a mobile phone app. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a while. But I want to uh, showcase this um, Waters to the Sea, Lake Superior Odyssey, just give you a very brief uh, introduction to it. We're going to be sending out links to all of these resources um, and more information about uh, the uh, Northern Night Starry Skies documentary. So you don't need to remember this per se, but just to let you know what's available, those of you who are teachers or those that just want to learn more. So clicking to join takes me to a menu screen and you can see these thumbnails across the bottom. These represent the major uh, content areas. So our Northern Night Starry Skies documentary is at the far left here. Uh, we have additional content about the night sky. And then going further, uh, lots of content about the lake itself, uh, the natural systems of the lake, rivers and watersheds of, of the North Shore. You can kind of look through these um, uh, 
uh, topics here. So uh, plenty of ecology, geology information. Uh, there's some interactive videos and uh, games, climate change content, uh, a lot of rich uh, content related to indigenous voices. We've worked closely with the Fond du Lac band and have a whole series of videos from there. Uh, plus the work we've done with Carl and Travis. And then aspects of history, lighthouses, shipping and fishing, logging, mining, and railroads. Uh, we have a time, historic timeline. So lots of rich information with profiles of these communities uh, throughout the region. Uh, we have uh, an artist view segment that highlights uh, the work of a variety of artists uh, as they've depicted and celebrated uh, the region. And then there's a strong focus on stewardship. So uh, we have a, uh, activities uh, to help reduce water pollution in Lake Superior, help uh, address light pollution and climate change action. So that's a quick overview. And just to look a little bit more uh, detail at our um, some of our night sky content, I wanted to open up in particular uh, an interactive uh, experience that we're designing, working with Carl and his artwork. And this is our Talking Sky um, uh, interactive experience. And this is a, a star map that Carl has made. And you can see the, the constellations that Travis has been sharing stories about are represented here. And the ones in yellow are ones that we have additional content about. So the links on the right open up this content. If you click on River of Souls, you'll see that video that uh, Travis played. Um, I'll click on the uh, moose just to give you a flavor of what uh, additional content we have. So there's a, essentially a slideshow that talks about these different constellations, when, what time they in the year they appear, what kinds of cultural activities are associated with um, uh, with that particular constellation and with that time of year, uh, information about the constellation itself, and then some artwork showing, in this case, how the moose is integrated into uh, Ojibwe culture. And uh, we're in the process of adding videos from our documentary to further enrich this. And I'm gonna conclude by uh, playing a very short video. Um, and this is, uh, hang on one sec. Um, so this is a very brief one about the one uh, uh, constellation we haven't heard about yet tonight. This is the, the Great Panther. So this is just a couple minutes long. Well, I got to tell you about the Panthers. The Panther is one of the first constellations my father pointed out to me. We can see the constellation of Leo that makes this big sickle here. The Ojibwe looked at it as the tail of the great panther. He called it curly tail, the great panther. And as the panther rises in spring, that's the season of floods and rains. And that's when the forest is real dangerous, and dangerous to cross that year. Snowshoes get all bogged down in the soggy snow. You're, there's water everywhere. And water has backed up every place. And the, the open water is very, very cold, very dangerous. So the association of the Great Panther with dangerous water came from the constellation. In Lake Superior, the Great Panther, the guardian of the copper at Isle Royal, has his lair underwater. And it's always associated with water. Now, the Panther gives us plenty of warning. He starts to rise while the ground is still frozen. So get around okay. But you know it's coming. You know it's coming. And so the admonition to the people who are watching for that consolation is get where you're going to go in the spring because you're not going to be able to travel very well for a couple of months. Yeah. So is there a, is there an Ojibwe story at all that you can share about the panther? There's actually many. They used to have ceremonies to the great panther where they would offer make offerings into the water and sink them. Uh, to the great panther that was down uh, down under the water. Because, of course, he controlled the storms. So that if you're a commercial fisherman or a, just even traveling on Lake Superior, you did that in order to ensure safe travel. You never take Lake Superior for granted. You never trust it. It can be dangerous. 
can be deadly, but it means is that there's nothing in nature that you can take for granted. You always have to respect it. You live your life in a kind of a constant state of respecting the danger mm -hmm. and you do something about it. You offer the great Panther's mm -hmm. gifts, or at the very least, you be aware of it all the time. Never take it for granted. I always like to think of nature as humbling the most proud that you you could be a very prideful and skillful hunter, but doggone it, they're just going to get you for f feeling that pride. Uh, a little respect and uh, humbleness is called for here to live in our part of the world. Um, so thank you for uh, joining us for that. I'm just going to wrap it up with a little bit more information about what's coming down the road here. And then we'll open it up for questions. If uh, you have comments and questions, we'd love to spend a few minutes doing that. Our documentary, as I mentioned, is going to be debuting on uh, WDSE, the Duluth Public Television Affiliate, the day after Thanksgiving, November 25th at 7 p.m. So those of you who are in that area would be able to to, to watch the program then. We're also gonna be doing a screening uh, in Grand Portage at the Grand Portage National Monument on December 10th. Uh, there will be broadcasts throughout Minnesota and other PBS affiliates around the country beginning after the new year. Uh, and we are gonna be doing a public screening at Hamlin University probably in February. So that's some things coming up with that. And also just to mention uh, these other resources we have available, we do have, what we're calling the North Shore Pocket Gallery. It's a, we call our kiosk the Multimedia Gallery, up to probably six hours of content about natural and cultural history of the region. The Pocket Gallery has all the same content uh, available uh, in your pocket. So it's an interpretive guide that you can take with you. It'll help you find places of interest and so forth. Um, so with that, I am going to stop and uh, we'll turn it back over to Tracy, I think, and uh, for further conversation. Well, I want to thank uh, everybody involved tonight. Um, uh, John, thank you for uh, envisioning this project about five years ago. You mentioned me, we should do this. I'm going, no, no one's going to fund it, but you know what? They did. And uh, uh, Travis, it's been a real joy to be able to connect with you and work together. I do want to give a special thought out to, shout out to Carl. He really wanted to make it tonight. He uh, he just said, I, I, I'm not feeling well, I'm feeling horrible and I hope he gets better. But I, I, we also said, well, of course you, we wouldn't ask you to come present if you're not feeling well. He said, I, I really want to make sure that I, I give a good presentation and, uh, uh, honors to kudos to John and Travis and the production team for capturing, uh, his stories. And I'm really proud that those can be shared. Uh, I like to think of, uh, of telling stories if you want the story to be told. And in the book, Carl is quite clear. He really wants these stories to be told, and uh, we're helping him achieve that goal. Uh, there's a, a couple of questions, uh, not a lot, and I do want to honor time. So we're going to just get right to those questions. Uh, the first one is from Kim. I have heard that some star stories can only be told in certain seasons, like after the first snowfall. Is that Dakota or more widespread? Uh, so we can be more respectful when we teach. Um, uh, Carl could could answer that, but Travis, I'm going to throw that over to you. Yeah, there are definitely stories that I've heard should only be told in the depths of winter. Um, but again, like as you mentioned, Tracy, Carl would know better what those stories are than I do because I'm still learning all of this stuff and yeah I, I'm, I'm not qualified to say what can and can't be told um I think what was shared tonight is it's in Carl's book so that was you know safe to share here tonight but yep definitely things that should only be um shared in the winter time Right, and to be real clear, Carl gave no restrictions to this, so uh, I think you can feel you can uh, share these. Uh, feel free to share these. I think that's what he he implicitly said. I want that to happen. Yeah. Um, there is another question here. Uh, how did Carl figure out what the pictographs mean? And I can I can answer that just very briefly in the sense that 
uh, he does a great job in his book describing that. And uh, I believe that we have a bit of that in uh, that is told in some of the film footage that we've taken. Um, and uh, I know that Carl would love to answer that himself. But what I took from it at a certain point, he said, I, I stopped thinking like an artist and thought like a, uh, a scientist because it, it had other meaning than just the art component of which it's beautiful. And, and Carl is a brilliant artist. So, you know, one lens is, OK, this is, is just art. Well, it's not just art, but it's art. But what I took and we said, when I opened up my thought to thinking like a scientist or as a, a, a storyteller or as somebody trying to interpret uh, is when it came to light. Um, Travis or John, do you have any more insight on, on that? Um, that's uh, that was he's done a nice he's done a nice job talking about that. But other insight. I think that was the gist of it. Yeah. He had to he had to just look at it differently and think of it, look at it through different lenses to more so than the lens that he was from most familiar with. What I took from it as well is that uh, at Hegman Lake, those three very important changing parts of the season are at one location. So it was a, uh, a I would call it a time-telling place. It was a place that had a strong story that was sharing with uh, with, with the people. The, the, the elders would, would know this, and it was an idea, as he talked about, now oh, it's dangerous. Uh, curly tail is dangerous. So water can be more dangerous than than winter, possibly. So I, I felt that was a marvelous thing. Uh, his book is great. Definitely recommend reading. It's a great read, and uh, we uh, we talk about that a bit uh, in, in our our work as well. Um, other questions. Uh, I think I, I have so many comments about the thank you and, and just the beautifulness of, of the imagery. Uh, I tell you, when we first met with uh, Cara, we have been working on our gift giving abilities of honoring. And uh, uh, I mean, what can you give a, 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 a gentleman that's got more art than, than, you know, than anything? Uh, but what he really wanted, uh, and we figured this out was uh, so one of Travis's uh, photographs. So we, he was just so honored to be able to get uh, an image that Travis had taken of the Northern Lights. And he was just uh, pleased as punch to get that. So we really felt that was a nice way to work together. And um, the other story I would tell about Carl is um, he was saying, you know, no one has written that story about the moose in 400 years. No one's painted that. And uh, John was saying, well, you know, we, we really like to talk about it. Uh, that was on a Tuesday. We went back up there on Friday and he had already painted the image. He says, don't tell anybody. I paint very fast. Uh, um, <laughs> and uh, it was just beautiful. And the way he had pulled that together was like, oh, my goodness. Uh, and I want to give a shout out to uh, Lee Simmons, uh, our, uh, our graphic artist, our, our graphic designer who animated that. And Carl was just so happy. He said she just got that so right. It's so subtle, so beautiful. So uh, I will just say it takes a team of people, uh, uh, folks that are here tonight and on a broader scale. Uh, and on, a, on a, a, the lar another large topic is the idea of saving our dark skies. There, there's a, a crisis going on of light pollution. And that's one of the essences that we are talking about in our uh, documentary, uh, Dark uh, Northern Night Starry Skies. And that is a component that we'd like people to, to move to social action, to move to behavior change. And there's more about that in that documentary as well. 